thank you for coming. It's, it's great to have you here. Um, so we'll just get straight into some of my questions and then we have, we'll have some audience questions afterwards. Um, so firstly, um, can you tell me a bit more about like, how you got into running and what sort of inspired you in those early stages of your career? Okay, um, well, I, st I actually can't remember the time when I first started running. Uh, I just think I was always running around. Um, my dad uh, was running marathons at the time. Uh, he'd run, I think, three or four Mersey marathons, a couple of London marathons. And I used to like joining in with him uh, at the weekend on a Sunday and just kind of just probably only doing about half a mile, a couple of kilometres max with him. Um, and then he took me down to the local athletics club, which at the time I was living in Cheshire, so it was Frodsham Harriers. Oh, I'm from uh, Cheshire. Are you? Yeah. yeah. So I joined Frodsham Harriers and um, I was with them until I was 11 when we moved down to, to Bedford. Um, we moved because of my dad's job mm -hmm. and my dad was brilliant. He went around and researched all the local cross country, all the local athletics clubs, um, which was kind of the best for what we wanted to do and found Bedford and County and found my coach, Alex and Rosemary Stanton. Um, and I've pretty much just been involved in it yeah. ever since then. So that first year, I went to the uh, National Cross Country Championships in Leicester and I finished 299th in the under 13 girls. Mm -hmm. And I was actually really happy because there were 600 and something people in the race. So I yeah. thought I'm in the first half of the field. And on the bus on the way back, my coach Alex was, was planning for next year and he wanted to get Bedford to the team title. So he went up to my mum and said, um, I want to get a girls team to, to win the under 13 title next year. Um, can Paula come down twice a week instead of once a week? And she kind of looked at him and she went, but why are you asking me? It's her, mm. so you need to ask. So he came up to ask me and I think the fact that he mm. had enough confidence to think I could be good enough to be in that team mm. was a real confidence boost to me. So I started going twice a week and then the next year we did win the team title and I finished fourth. So it was a big, big sort of illustration to me of setting targets and walk, working towards them with a long-term plan. Mm. And what for you has been like your, vic like your biggest sort of victory or something or a race that you felt the most satisfied with in terms of overcoming like challenges? Um, I think for me it was the World Cross Country in, yeah. in 2001 because um, I'd gone to, to Boston in 1992 and I'd won the World Junior title there. Um, and I'd made it one of my goals to win the senior title to go with it. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of years, that was 1992 to mm -hmm. 2001, uh, a lot of seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, and thinking I'm never gonna be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, in 2001, I'd already sort of moved on to the challenge of the marathon, but I wanted to finish the cross country because I didn't know mm -hmm. that I would continue to combine the two. I thought I might be leaving cross country behind me. So it was kind of like my, my last chance in, in my mind. So it was really sweet to be able to win it mm. and to win it in a sprint finish as well, where it was really special. And it was one of only two times in my whole life or, or racing career where I've known I was going to win it yeah. um, and had that little inner voice. I didn't have it when I set world records and I didn't have it when I've won other championships, yeah. but I just had this little voice kind of telling me what to do in the race and yeah. just to leave it and then to, to kick then. And, it's kind of quite scary, but yeah. also it gives you a big confidence boost to almost like feel so sure inside that what you're doing is the right thing. Yeah, and like going on from that, like how do you mentally prepare yourself for your marathons and your races? Because like do, you said that that was when you had like that inner voice. Do you, do you have to like train yourself to have it or how does it? I think it's a very important thing. I think whatever you do in life, listening to your instincts and trusting your instincts is a big point because mm. sometimes we can't say why we think it's the right thing to do it just yeah. feels like it's the right thing to do and I don't know whether then because psychologically it feels like the right thing to do you're stronger because you feel like you're doing the right thing mm. maybe that's all um, interrelated in that way as well but I think yeah that preparation to a point where you know that whatever happens you've done as much preparation mm. as you possibly could so you're going into it as well prepared as you can mm. you can't control the other people you can only control yourself mm. so you can only get yourself to that start line or to whatever your goal is mm. having done the best preparation that you can yeah. and then you can only give it your best shot mm. and then you're going to find out how good you can be so it's kind of I think a lot of that kind of inner voice and inner confidence mm. comes from trusting your instincts and working on your strengths but also making sure that you are as well prepared as yeah. you possibly can be yeah. and sort of I think someone actually asked this before in the meet and greet but what well, is there another racer who's kind of pushed your limits or like really made you think, oh, I've got to, you know, 
push myself harder? Um, I think there's there's been there's been a, a lot over the years. I think. Oh God, when I, when I was a child growing up, I used to race all the time with a girl called Charlotte Mayock, whose um, yeah. uh, older brother John actually was an international runner, but yeah. Charlotte never quite made it to that level, but she beat me all the time. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, as I was an under 13, under 15, and she was just that person that I was always trying to get a little bit closer yeah. to. Um, and then I think later on, Dorata Tulu, um, Gabriella Zabo a little bit was kind of a uh, nemesis, um, Gatawami. We used to race all the time and they could always finish better than me. So I always yeah. kind of knew that I had to, to do something earlier in the race to, to have a chance yeah. uh, of beating them. And then Catherine Deraba as well. And I, I mean, when I set the world record in Chicago and in London, but more in Chicago, the biggest thing that day was actually winning the race because mm -hmm. uh, she was holding the world record at the time. Yeah. She was in really good shape. so. I, I really couldn't make any mistakes in going after a time because yeah. first and foremost I had to try and win the race and I think yeah. that pushed then the time came about because I was trying to win the race and that was the best way that I could win that race. Yeah and is there someone you would l like would have loved to sort of compete against like past or present? Yeah. Ingrid Christensen. <laughs> I would have loved to have raced Ingrid and Greta yeah. and Joni actually so for me they're kind of I call them the three first ladies um, yeah. uh, and I think they're just for the people they are as much as for the achievements mm -hmm. that they had. So Greta Weitz, for, she was an amazing lady and the, mm -hmm. the courage that she raced with, but the courage that she fought cancer with right to the mm -hmm. end um, was a huge inspiration mm -hmm. and I would love to have been able to, yeah. to have raced her over yeah. the cross country. That's amazing. Uh -huh. um, so like looking at the sort of industry more broadly, like what are the sort of specific challenges that women face in uh, sort of racing and running? Um, Oh gosh, um, see, I think, yeah, women face challenges, but I think we've also, in some areas, got advantages mm. too. Um, I don't think athletics or, or running is a sport in any way where there's inequality and that there isn't a level playing field. Mm. I think the prize money's pretty much the same. The events are pretty much the same where they're not. There's a, there's a good reason for it, for mm. heights of hurdles and, and weight of implements and things like that, but it's, mm. not, it's not huge differences so I don't feel that it's it's something where women need to be campaigning to, mm. to get themselves taken seriously I do think from a from a coaching training point of view mm. it's very different to to coach a female mm. as to uh, than it would be to coach a male I think there are different techniques that you use to motivate and get the best out of mm. people and I think that kind of understanding and I think yeah, the women's, on the women's side, you've got the physiological mm. challenges of kind of managing periods around racing, fluctuating hormones and things like that, that the men don't even have to worry about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, on that side of things, but I, mm. the actual equality issue, I don't see it as a big issue. Yeah. Uh, it's more of an understanding and tailoring of everybody is yeah. unique within those categories. Every woman is different to, to the woman yeah. next to her as well. So it is all different, but generally, yeah there's a different approach to, to motivating and to getting the best out of a training programme for a woman. Yeah, and for you after you had um, a child, how was it getting back into running? Was it difficult? Or? No, um, but I don't <laughs> think I ever thought, nobody ever put in my mind yeah. that I couldn't have a baby and come yeah. back. Um, and I'd seen people like Liz McColgan, Sonia O'Sullivan, um, Ingrid Christensen, yeah. have children and come back and race yeah. just as well. So I knew that before I'd ever kind of made it a goal to be a, whatever set my goals for within athletics, I wanted to be a mum. Mm. And it had always been part of my kind of long-term plan. And I didn't want to put that off and get to the end of my career, which I didn't see happening anytime soon. It was always going to get forced on me by injury, otherwise mm. I'd still be running now. Um, so I didn't want to get there and think, oh no, I left it too late to, to do something else yeah. that I really wanted to do. So I just kind of worked it. I was really lucky. Yeah. I had um, great support from my husband and from the family around that in being able to just kind of fit the the training yeah. around and in some ways it's easier to go back <laughs> to a full-time job as an athlete mm. and be a mum. Mm. It's much easier than it would be in a kind of a professional, any other professional mm. career because you've got that big window in the middle of the day where you can spend time so you've kind of got the morning training session and the evening mm. training session when you need to be focused and, and be able to do that and know that they're okay but then you've got a lot of time within yeah. the day where you can still spend with them and they're sleeping as well so you need <laughs> to be getting sleep so I just that was the key thing I guess that I was lucky that my two slept through the night from very early mm. on. And how has the sort of in industry changed since the start of your career and has there been anything which you found challenging in these changes? Um, 
I think it's changing all the time and it's yeah. evolving all the time. Um, I think, I mean, th there's lots of different elements to it. I think the marketing of the sport now is probably facing one of its biggest challenges. There are a lot more sports that athletics is competing with um, from a marketing point of view, but also from an introduction of youngsters into the sport, from attracting youngsters mm -hmm. into the sport. There are lots of things we need to do to, to kind of get people to see what a great sport it is and to mm -hmm. get them in the door in the first place and to support them going through there. So that's a big challenge now. I think we've probably the doping side of the sport and the damage that that's done to the sport has, it's probably always been there, but mm. it kind of came up in just the general public's acceptance of that and the athletes as well. I mean, mm. I think when I started out in the sport, 80s, 90s was probably a pretty bad time for doping, but I actually naively, when I came into it, didn't think it was something that applied to distance racing mm. at all. And it's only looking back now, I'm thinking, oh, yeah. uh, it probably was, but it just, yeah, you, you need to, it wasn't talked about yeah. and it wasn't confronted. So I think now it, it is being talked about, it is being confronted, mm -hmm. but it needs a lot more investment yeah. in that side of it. And it needs a lot more willingness yeah. from all aspects of the sport to, to really beat it and to combat it. Yeah, and you mentioned before about the life ban. Um, can you just talk a bit more about like your thoughts on that and relation to cheating? Um, well, I'm a big um, supporter of life bans for hard offences. So we talked about not for something like a, a missed test or a, a genuine mistake where somebody's taken an over-counter medication that's produced a, a positive drugs test, but for the category A drugs, so things like steroids, um, EPO, uh, things like that, then I'm a big supporter uh, of a life ban because I do think it does huge damage to the sport. There's a certain amount of evidence that particularly the steroids, once they've been taken, that that advantage is it remains in the body mm -hmm. and we don't know how long it remains in the body. Mm -hmm. Even if they're then not cheating when they come back, they still have gained an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that side of it. And I do think that it's not athletics isn't a human right to be able to take part in our sport. Mm -hmm. It's you play by the rules and if you don't play by the rules, then you get asked to leave. And you, if you don't make the deterrence high enough, mm -hmm. then what people stand to gain from cheating is, is too great and there's not enough of a, a risk in their minds. So mm. there are always going to be people who, who, yeah. who choose to take that, that shorter path. Yeah. And just going back to your um, sort of earlier point about <laughs> getting young people involved in sport, how do, what do you think is like the best way to encourage them to sort of get more involved or like... I think it has to be fun for them. It's, yeah. it's, it's like whatever we choose to do in life, if it's a passion and it's something that we really love, we're going to put so much more of ourselves into it and invest so much more. Um, so I think it's the one thing, I mean, I'm probably, I'm not, but I'm really keen that my kids are active yeah. and physically active, but I want them to choose their sports mm. because they, then going to be far more likely to keep doing them mm. through the tough times and through the injured times and the rough times if it's something that they really love doing and it's the same for whatever area of life. I mean I remember when years and years ago now um, I was trying to decide which A-levels to, to yeah. choose and my dad just saying well pick the subjects you like yeah. because if you don't know exactly where you're going if you choose a subject you like you're just going to enjoy that time yeah. far more than if you're doing something just because it leads yeah. to something else. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I think we'll take some questions from the audience now. So if you have any, um, please just raise your hand and we'll bring a mic over to you. Yeah, can we get you at the back there? Um, hi, Paula. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, when you're preparing for a big race, what's your sort of daily routine? Um, in the actual hard training block or in the, the days before, in the hard training blocks when I was preparing for a marathon, it was pretty much just train, eat and sleep um, and different recovery things. So I used to sleep, I used to sleep about 12 hours a day. I'd sleep 10 hours at night and then get up and then depending on what the session was, if it was a hard track session or a workout, I would have some breakfast um, and then go out for my run about sort of... 9 30 10 o'clock um, and then that would take a couple of hours come back um, eat shower massage stretching have a two-hour nap um, and then some other core strength or weight training and then another run in the evening and then eat again <laughs> um, relax a little bit and then just sleep so it was kind of like there wasn't much else in there but at the same time i, I would never say that it was a sacrifice 
because I, I actually enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I think it was, it, it, it was, some, it was a pleasure. It wasn't a sacrifice that I felt like I had to do. Um, it was just what I felt was get the, the best. And so being able to sleep that long, it's a luxury I can't have now. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we get any more questions? Yeah, can we get you over here on the side? Hi, Paula. Uh, could you tell me, uh, uh, to what extent did you use heart rate-based training uh, during New Year's? And was there a specific time that you started it? And um, what would you recommend? And yeah. It's a good question. I used one. Um, I mean, essentially, when I was in my hard blocks of training, the, the really accurate kind of Garmin type things hadn't come in yet anyway. Um, so it was pretty much the, the only measure outside of just measuring out with a measuring wheel and stuff on the track that we would use in training. I wasn't very good at listening to it. So it was more a tool for my coach to look back on and see how hard I'd been working in the runs rather than for me. I never stayed within thresholds. Um, I wasn't very, just wasn't very good at it. I preferred to just run how I felt. Um, so he would just, if he tried to tell me, he quickly learned that it didn't actually work. So it was better him looking back and rather just telling me how to do it effort wise within the session. Um, can we get you over here? Yeah. You can just shout out. No. <laughs> How did you deal with um, criticism throughout your career from either coaches or from the media in general? Um, I think it's something that's really hard to, to deal with and you, it's definitely something that you learn kind of by being put in that situation and by going through it. So I think the first couple of times that it happened are always the hardest. Um, probably the hardest times for me the first hard time was probably Athens, um, when I kind of wasn't able to, to finish the race there. And that criticism in the media, and it felt like amongst other people, probably preempted me moving out of the UK um, because I felt like I'd lot, let a lot of people down. And it's, it got to a point where I was, I vividly remember now being out on a training run in Flagstaff and not being able to carry on with the run because I was so upset about something untrue that had been written in one of the papers um, and sitting down because I couldn't carry on running and then just thinking this is stupid because this is stopping me doing something that I want to do. They don't actually know what they're talking about. Um, and I think until that point I tried to say, oh, I'm not bothered what people think, but inside I was. Um, and so that was kind of my first, I guess, toughening up and thinking, okay, you can't please, you learn, you can't please all the people all the time. So you can only concentrate on kind of being true to yourself and the people around you, the people that you trust and you see on a daily basis and respect and make sure that they're, you're, you're not being criticised. If, if I'm criticised by them, I would listen far more and kind of do something to take it on board than if it's unjust criticism. And then the other time was in 2015. And I think that was probably the hardest time in, in my life um, because my whole integrity was questioned uh, in the media. and in a very unfair way that I had no clue how to, to combat because I think I had always up until that point thought if you've never done anything wrong you're never going to be accused of having done something wrong and you're always going to be able to prove that you didn't do something wrong and it was it was a very very tough time uh, and I think I'm just very fortunate that I had a lot of good people around me who really supported me through that and I think when you know inside that it's not true then it definitely helps it helps to Kind of, so I guess the, the answer to that is you can never be fully tough against um, the criticism, but so long as you are true to yourself and you know what is the criticism that is just and isn't just, um, then you can kind of hold your head up high and just kind of just get through it. But it's never nice. Thank you. Um, should we take one from the back? Um, just you and the scarf over there. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, were there ever times in your training when you like just thought you really couldn't be bothered to go out for a run? And if so, like, what would you tell yourself in those times? And also now, do you enjoy like running more or less or the same? Um, it's probably the same now, but I think, yes, everybody has those times in training where you just think, oh, wow, I'm just so tired. And I just really, I don't want to go. I can't be bothered to go. And I think sometimes that's actually the right thing to do is just not go in that case um, because sometimes it's almost your body knowing that it's too tired to be able to do the training session so I used to have a little bit sometimes kind of a 10 minute rule so once I got 10 minutes into my run if I still felt like I really didn't want to be out there then I just turn around and go home because okay? it just wasn't happening that day and kind of like 
I felt like it wasn't a quality run then anyway, because you're just getting through it and you're not doing it well. So better to just take the rest and come back and do it properly the next time you, you come and do it. So, and I think when you're, when you're training hard volumes, there are always going to be those days. And sometimes once you get out there, it might just be because it's raining or it's really cold outside. And then once you get out there, you feel fine and you're enjoying it. Um, but there are times when it just really feels like this is way harder than it should do. And then it's probably your body trying to tell you something and you need to, to listen to it and to, to back off. Um, and then what's the second part of the question? Sorry. Yeah, just whether now you enjoy running like more Yeah, um, probably more than or better than I thought I would do. I've adjusted to kind of missing the, the buzz of, of racing and the buzz of actually pushing your body as hard as you can. And I think for me, that was made easier because when I had the big foot surgery in 2012 and I couldn't run for nine months and I didn't know if I'd be able to get back to running at all, it made me value the fact that I could just get out and just run socially and just run for me so much that I didn't really miss the racing side of it that badly. Um, and I think so long as I can still have that kind of time in the day, which is my time for just letting my mind wander or letting my mind not even think at all or sorting things out in my head and just generally feeling better, um, I can get that from my runs now. And then also you can do more of the social side of it, which when you're competing, you can't. You can't run along and just chat with your friend because they're not good enough and you can't, you've got to keep pushing on. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I can just jog along, and even though my friends say, just, just go. I say, no, 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 I'm quite happy just, just running along, I can chat. And I can do the same with the kids as well. And that's really nice to be able to, to now share it with my children the way that kind of I shared it with my dad growing up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know if your friends can actually speak to you whilst they're trying to keep up. <laughs> I do get told that a lot. You just keep talking, we'll just keep listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question. Um, can we get you right at the back with the red jumper? Yeah. Hi. Um, one of the things I found really impressive about you is just how long your world record has stood. Because that's, I mean, almost almost unprecedented in athletics. Um, I was wondering, firstly, while you were running that, how were you feeling? Did you, did you feel that it was going really, really well? And secondly, could you reflect upon why you think that record has stood as long as it has? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a difficult question. Uh, when, I, when I was running it, I absolutely knew that I, I was running well, and I knew going into that, that the training had gone really, really well. I was coming off the back of the Chicago Marathon in October of the previous year, in April for the London Marathon. Um, so I knew that there were elements of the Chicago run that I could do better and I could improve on. And then I compared the training a lot because I was out in Albuquerque um, preparing for London. And I compared it with the previous year and I could see that I was in better shape and I'd run 218.56 the previous year. So I think I pretty much went into it with a plan. We had a big mantra of not setting limits. So I didn't go in aiming for a time. I just wanted to run faster than I had done in Chicago. And so my only really race plan was to try and hit as many miles as possible as I could under the average of 5.13, which was the average from Chicago. Uh, and it was only when I was coming along the embankment. I mean, I knew I was up on it from the halfway splits and stuff, but I was coming along the embankment. At the time, Peter Elliott was doing the BBC camera bike and he pulled alongside me. And he shouted, because my husband was on the lead truck, he shouted to me, Gary says, if you pick it up, you can break 216. And a lot of rude things went through my head because I was already pushing as hard as I could at that stage. And it was easy for him to stay sitting in the truck. Um, but um, I just knew that, I knew that I was running really well. I didn't know, you don't know when that day is ever going to happen again or if it's going to happen again. So I wanted to make sure that I could run as fast as I could so I could step off that course and know that I'd run as fast as I could on that day. So I did keep pushing really, really hard. Um, and in the last 800 meters, I was trying to work out in my head if that meant I was going to get under 216 or not. Because in London, it's only really when you turn, you've got about 150 meters to go up the mile that you can actually see the, the clock in front. So then I knew I could, I could break 216 and I was just trying to run as fast as I could um, to the line then. But when I finished, I think I thought I could improve it again. Um, <laughs> And I remember being really annoyed because I heard Dave Bedford say that he was never going to see it beaten um, in, in his lifetime of being race director. And I was thinking, yeah, but I can come back and beat it. But it never, <laughs> it never worked out like that because I was never in good enough shape at the right time around races and, and things like that. So I don't know why it's, it's stood. I think it's that 
combination and maybe just the kind of mental makeup of just part of me, part of what I wanted to achieve was seeing how fast I could run. So maybe I had a shorter career because of that, because I ran all of my marathons as hard as I could. Um, and you could say it's wiser, but it's just a different approach now that I think a lot of the, the female runners are more looking at how much they can, how many races they can win in their career and how much money they can make in their career rather than how fast they can go. So it's just a different motivation. Um, and I think it's, it's also a little bit of luck in the marathon that you get in that shape at the right time for the right race and you get good conditions and it's on a fast course and things just come together a little bit on the day. Um, can we get um, this person at the side, please? Um, am I right in thinking you're coached by your husband, Gary? Um, in the later stages of my career, yeah. I started out uh, and I was coached by Alex um, Stanton from when I was 11 pretty much all the way through. Um, and then in 90, oh God, 1992, I met my husband, but in 1997, he started to come away um, on training camps with us and he was still an athlete. He was still trying to compete over 1500 meters then. Um, but then he had a, quite a bad injury, knee injury and he wasn't able to keep competing. So he switched to be my training partner. And then somewhere around 99, maybe he switched to be my manager. Um, but because we were kind of a, a close-knit team and Alec was already 76, 77 by then, he wanted to travel less. So it was more kind of an evolution, I guess. And instead of it being a three-way input into the training from Alec <coughs> and Gary and myself, it became into more of a two, but I still speak to Alec on the phone now. Um, it was just that he wasn't traveling so much to the races. So we, yeah, we would kind of say that, that Gary was coaching me because he was part of that team. but. A lot of it was really just doing the same things that Alec had put in place. Because I was just wondering how it um, affected your relationship and like could you kind of drop the running when you went home or was it, did it get really intense? It's yeah it can get tense and I think you've got to have certain ground rules in place um, and you can't let things fester you've got to kind of discuss things as they need to come out but also not bring the training home with you all the time and I think certainly having kids helps that because they immediately trump anything that you're talking about when you come in the door anyway their needs come first and so that makes it much easier to leave the kind of running thing aside um I th yeah i think i think because he had been an athlete as well um and because he was we kind of we knew each other so well i think it, it, the way it evolved made it easier than had it been kind of the relationship and then oh you're you're just going to come in and coach me it kind of it felt more organic I guess the way it came around and then um, sorry just one more um, doing such high mileage how did you manage your injury risk um, I don't know if you do I think it catch it caught up with me eventually um, but I think you do as many things as possible when you're putting in the high mileage to to kind of reduce that risk as much as possible so it's really looking after your diet trying to refuel as quickly as possible stay really well hydrated getting enough sleep Massage worked really well for me. Ice baths worked really well for me. Um, and yeah, I think it's a little bit of luck as well. I think for a long time I was lucky in that I had a body that absorbed training well and was able to kind of keep training and keep putting in that high mileage without breaking down. Um, yes. Can we have you at the front? Oh, I'll just stand up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, Paula. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. So, you mentioned Dave Bedford, the race record for London Marathon. He was here a few months ago with Iliad Kipchoge and announced that Iliad would be competing against Mo Farah at this year's London Marathon. Um, and since you're, uh, as I understand, your husband is also Mo's coach, I yeah. wondered if you could comment on how you think that race will go down. Who's going to win? Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, I think I think Elliot's the overwhelming favourite. Uh, and I think in fairness and no disrespect to Mo, there are other people also in the race, um, the likes of Adola, the likes of Wanjiri, who are probably ahead of, of Mo. Um, having said that, he's the ultimate competitor and he wants to, to do well in that race, but he's very much viewing it as a, as a learning experience, I think, the first time out. I think he kind of struggled in the beginning to get his head around the marathon training, um, but now it's, it's going really well. And I think he's really looking forward to the race. 
um, but he's seeing it as a progression. So for him, I think a success would be kind of British record. Um, I don't think he's thinking of like breaking the two hour barrier next week. I think he's, he's kind of building up towards that. And I think with Mo, it's kind of, it's looking at it realistically as well. And he's ranked higher in the world over 1500 meters than he actually is over marathon. Um, and to have that range from kind of 3.28 to, to 2.02, it's a, it's a huge big ask. He's the best in the world at five and 10,000 meters. I don't think he's expecting to come in and be the best in the world uh, at marathon. And I think that his body is probably more suited to, and his temperament as well is probably better suited to racing five and 10,000 meters than it is at the marathon. But I do think he can run a good marathon. He's just not gonna run 2.2. <laughs> okay, can we get the next question? Um, should we have you in the purple jumper? Um, hi, I was just wondering if at any point during your career you felt you'd been let down at all by the sport or any of the like associations involved? Um, <clears throat> I think when I was in my career, not hugely i think there were a couple of occasions that i think in 2001 when i actually held up the sign in, in edmonton i think then i felt that not me personally but a lot of the athletes a lot of my peers in the sport had been let down because it was just frustrating that boxes hadn't been ticked and yet there we are stood on the start line next to someone who has, has, to all extents and purposes been proven to have been cheating but through a technicality is able to be standing on that start line so that felt like I was really let down um, I think then in 2015 I think I felt like let down by a lot of people but not people sort of in power in our sport but not actually on a day-to-day -day basis in touch with our sport and I think that was the biggest way that you felt let down, yeah, by the obvious ones of corruption, but by the others who just didn't, didn't see it and didn't ask enough questions and didn't lost sight of the fact that the number one duty of any sports federation is to, to look after the athletes and to protect the rights of the athletes. And I think that was lost sight of there. And I think they are trying to get back to that now, um, but it's hard to win credibility back when it's been lost and it's, it's gonna be a tough road. Great, thank you. Um, any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> have you ever had any rituals or anything to get you in the zone on race day or anything funny um, like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot. I mean, when I was when I was younger, I used to have kind of lucky everything um, that I would wear on race day. And then it kind of developed into kind of what I call lucky, lucky jewellery. So earrings and a ring that I would wear um, on racing day. And I had the same safety pins to pin on my numbers since I was 11. Um, and I still have them. I just gave them to my daughter. Um, so they're a little bit rusty. And I think it, more than it being something that I was like superstitious and addicted to, it was more that if that's there, it's one less thing to think about on race day because that's what I always put on. So I'm not having to think about what I put on a race day. It's just that. Um, and I also used to race in the same kit. So even though Nike would give me the like lots of racing uniforms, if I raced well in one at the beginning of the season, I would just keep wearing that same one for the races mm -hmm. all the way through the season. Um, and it caused a few problems in 2002 because they gave me a uniform for the London Marathon and then I ran really well and it had a line through the swoosh and apparently there's some doctrine somewhere in Nike that says that you can't ever put a line through the swoosh um, but mine had it and all season they kept saying get her out of it get her out of it and I was like no it's my lucky kit I'm wearing it <laughs> um, and so I wore it the whole way through and I even ran in Chicago in, in it as well um, so yeah I think those habits um, more than superstitions really help Okay. Um, can we get um, you just in the middle here? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. What do you like to think about when you're running? If it's yeah. either like a long, slow session or something really hard? Um, lots of things. I mean, I think if it's something really hard or if it's a race, I'm very focused on what I need to focus on in the race. So kind of how I'm feeling 
my form, um, things like drinks bottles coming up in a marathon, how people around you sound as well as look, because a lot of times when you're just looking ahead, you don't want to look at your rivals, but you can get a lot of information by how they actually sound, um, particularly when they're ones that you're used to racing all the time, so you've got something to compare it with. Um, but when I'm training, my mind just drifts off all over. It's a bit like sometimes when you're driving and you end up somewhere and you don't know how you got there. Um, that happens on, on runs quite a bit because my mind's just wandering. And a lot of my, um, if, I'm, if I have to write something, I'll go for a run and I'll come back and I'll write it down really quickly. A lot of, when I was at university, if I was stuck on something, I'd just go out for a run. And then it'd be much clearer when I was running and I'd kind of be able to think much better. I don't know whether it's because I was just more comfortable because you get more oxygen to your brain or, or what it is, but I just found that it was a way that would, would help me think more clearly, or not think sometimes as well. Great. Um, can we just get you at the very back? Thank you for coming. Uh, regarding the business of athletics, how important has it been for an athlete as yourself to get sponsorship, and then how do you also decide what sponsors you should partner with? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think when you start out, and probably the best way is all the way through, is not to think of it too much like a business. It, it kind of has to be because you, you're making the money and then you're reinvesting it back into your training and back into the support. Um, but if you wouldn't be doing it without any sponsorship, you have to question whether you should be doing it in the first place or whether you've got enough motivation to be in it. So I think I was, I was very lucky in terms of the, the sponsorship opportunities presented themselves to me quite early on. So um, I won the World Junior Cross Country in 92 and I was going away to university. That, that was in um, March. And then I was going away to university in that September. So I already had a sponsorship deal, I mean a base one, but a sponsorship deal when I went away to university. And I think in my mind, I then set myself the target of, okay, I've got four years because I was doing languages at uh, university, so I'm gonna work as hard as I can over that period then give myself two years when I've finished to see if I can make it as a professional athlete. Um, and if I don't, then I'm gonna have to go and get a proper job. Uh, and if I do, then I'll be able to, to keep doing it. And I was lucky in that it was able to work out. Um, but I have a couple of basic rules that I stick to um, when working with any kind of sponsorship or endorsement is that I won't endorse anything that I haven't tried and that I genuinely believe is a good product. Um, and yeah, that has to kind of fit with my standards and my moral beliefs and integrity side of it uh, as well. So I try and kind of put those in as much as possible. Um, can we get you at the front? Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are about being a vegetarian and a marathon runner. I've not actually tried it, so <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any reason why it can't work. Um, I think you just have to be very um, careful and focused on the fact that you get enough protein because too many times people think that endurance sports and marathon is just about the carbohydrates, but it's not because you, if you don't have the muscle, you've got nothing to store your glycogen in. So if you're not supporting your body well enough with protein, you're probably gonna get sick and you're probably gonna break down and get injured and you're certainly gonna get to the closing stages of the marathon and not have enough glycogen stores to be able to keep running as well as you could have been. So I don't think it matters whether you're getting it from meat, um, animal protein sides or from vegetable proteins, you're just gonna make sure you're getting enough protein in there, really. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, this one. Uh, oh, can we get you over there? Um, once you become injured, what do you think is important for overcoming that? Um, I think staying positive, um, trying to find something else to channel that focus that you would have put into the training in and channeling it into the injury recovery techniques is a good way to, to try and do that. So kind of with the same discipline that you would go out for your training, do the icing 15 minutes of every hour, um, do the exercises uh, and the strengthening. And when you can get into the cross training, even though it doesn't maybe give you the same enjoyment as going for a run, just try and do as much as you can of that because it makes getting back into it better. And I think just, just always believe that you will get back at some point. It might be a long road, but don't think, oh, this is, this is the end now. Just look at it as a kind of stepping stone along the way. Um, can we get you over there in the camo? Um, 
Have you ever taken inspiration from other sports in your training? Um, yeah, um, I think from, from different sports that I'd watch, I think probably the biggest one actually is tennis from Roger Federer, um, because I think the way that, I mean, the way that he plays is just inspirational to watch anyway, but it's more his attitude of kind of, this is what I love doing. So even when I'm a long way from number one, I'm still going to keep doing it because I actually, he was in that lucky situation. He didn't have to go and do something else. And he enjoyed just playing. And I think that kind of inspiration of doing something and being absolutely the best in the world at it, but still it being something that you really love doing, I think was a, is a big inspiration. Um, I have one more question from me, actually. What, what would be your advice to runners who are trying to sort of break into the professional ranks? Um, I think, again, I wouldn't make it about that. I would just yeah. make it about seeing how good you can be and looking at all of the areas and trying to, <coughs> trying to improve what you can, control what you can and improve those areas where you know you can work on. And then it's, it's either going to get you that level or it's not, but trying to, it's kind of looking at it backwards that way. You've just got to try and get the best out of yourself yeah. um, and then see if that evolves into to being a professional way uh, and a professional lifestyle. But yeah. you've kind of got to plan for it professionally anyway mm. to see whether you're going to get to that point. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we have time for today, actually. But um, thank you so much for coming. Um, mm -hmm. It was Good wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.